Hello and welcome to Sleep Cove. This episode includes three classic fairy tales of Red Riding Hood, Sleeping Beauty and Snow White. I hope you enjoy them. If you prefer your bedtime stories with some relaxing music, the link for the fairy tale video is in the YouTube comments pinned to the top. Please do not listen to this or any other sleep recording whilst driving or operating heavy machinery. Please listen to in a place where you can safely go to sleep. And let's begin. This is the classic tale of Sleeping Beauty. A king and queen, once upon a time, reigned in a country a great way off, where there were in those days fairies. Now this king and queen had plenty of money, and plenty of fine clothes to wear, and plenty of good things to eat and drink, and a coach to ride out in in every day. But though they had been married many years, they had no children, and this grieved them very much indeed. But one day, as the queen was walking by the side of the river, at the bottom of the garden, she saw a poor little fish that had thrown itself out of the water and lay gasping and nearly dead on the bank. Then the queen took pity on the little fish and threw it back again into the river and before it swam away it lifted its head out of the water and said I know what your wish is and it shall be fulfilled in return for your kindness to me you will soon have a daughter what the little fish had foretold soon came to pass and the queen had a little girl so very beautiful that the king could not cease looking on it for joy and said he would hold a great feast and make merry and show the child to all the land so he asked his kinsmen and nobles and friends, and neighbours. But the queen said, I will have the fairies also, that they might be kind and good to our little daughter. Now there were thirteen fairies in the kingdom, but as the king and queen had only twelve golden dishes for them to eat out of, they were forced to leave one of the fairies without asking her. So twelve fairies came, each with a high red cap on her head, and red shoes with high heels on her feet, and a long white wand in her hand. And after the feast was all over, they gathered round in a ring, and gave all their best gifts to the little princess. One gave her goodness, another beauty, another riches, and so on till she had all that was good in the world. Just as eleven of them had done blessing her, a great noise was heard in the courtyard, and word was brought that the thirteenth fairy was come with a black cap on her head, and black shoes on her feet, and a broomstick in her hand, and presently up she came into the dining hall. Now, as she had not been asked to the feast, she was very angry, and scolded the king and queen very much, and set to work to take her revenge. So she cried out, the king's daughter shall, in her fifteenth year, 
be wounded by a spindle and fall down dead. Then the twelfth of the friendly fairies, who had not given her gift, came forward and said that the evil wish must be fulfilled, but she could soften its mischief. So her gift was that the king's daughter, when the spindle wounded her, should not really die, but should only fall asleep for a hundred years. However, the king, still to save his dear child, altogether from the threatened evil, so he ordered that all spindles in the kingdom should be bought up and burnt. But all the gifts of the first eleven fairies were in the meantime fulfilled, for the princess was so beautiful and well behaved and good and wise that everyone who knew her loved her. It happened on the very day she was fifteen years old. The king and queen were not at home, and she was left alone in the palace. So she roved about it by herself, and looked at all the rooms and chambers, till at last she came to an old tower, to which there was a narrow staircase, ending with a little door. In the door there was a golden key, and when she turned it, the door sprang open, and there sat an old lady, spinning away, very busily. Why? How now? Good mother, said the princess. What are you doing there? Spinning, said the old lady, and nodded her head humming a tune, while Buzz went the wheel. How prettily that little thing turns round, said the princess, and took the spindle and began to try and spin. But scarcely had she touched it, before the fairy's prophecy was fulfilled. The spindle wounded her, and she fell down, lifeless on the ground. However, she was not dead, but had only fallen into a deep sleep, and the king and the queen, who had just come home, and all their court, fell asleep too, and the horses slept in the stables, and the dogs in the court, the pigeons on the housetop, and the very flies slept upon the walls. Even the fire on the hearth left off blazing and went to sleep. The jack stopped, and the spit that was turning about, with a goose upon it for the king's dinner, stood still, and the cook who was at that moment pulling the kitchen boy by the hair to give him a box on the ear for something he had done amiss, let him go, and both fell asleep. The butler, who was slyly tasting the ale, fell asleep with a chug at his lips, and thus everything stood still and slept soundly. A large hedge of thorns soon grew round the palace, and every year it became higher and thicker, till at last the old palace was surrounded and hidden, so that not even the roof or the chimneys could be seen. But there went a report through all the land of the beautiful sleeping Briar Rose, for so the king's daughter was called, so that from time to time several king's sons came and tried to break through the thicket into the palace. 
This, however, none of them could ever do, for the thorns and bushes laid hold of them as if it were with hands, and there they stuck fast and died wretchedly. After many, many years, there came a king's son into that land, and an old man told him the story of the thicket of thorns, and how a beautiful palace stood behind it, and how a wonderful princess called Briar Rose lay in it to sleep with all her court. He told too how he had heard from his grandfather that many, many princes had come and had tried to break through the thicket, but they had all stuck fast in it and died. Then the young prince said, All this shall not frighten me, I will go and see this briar rose. The old man tried to hinder him, but he was bent upon going. Now that very day the hundred years were ended, and as the prince came to the thicket, he saw nothing but beautiful flowering shrubs, through which he went with ease, and they shut in after him as thick as ever. Then he came at last to the palace, and there in the court lay the dogs asleep, and the horses were standing in the stables, and on the roof sat the pigeons fast asleep, with their heads under their wings. And when he came into the palace, the flies were sleeping on the walls, the spit was standing still, the butler had the jug of ale at his lips, going to drink a draught. The maid sat with a fowl in her lap ready to be plucked, and the cook in the kitchen was still holding up her hand, as if she was going to beat the boy. Then he went on still farther, and all was so still that he could hear every breath he drew, till at last he came to the old tower and opened the door of the little room in which Briar Rose was, and there she lay, fast asleep on the couch by the window. She looked so beautiful that he could not take his eyes off her, so he stooped down and gave her a kiss, but the moment he kissed her, she opened her eyes and awoke, and smiled upon him, and they went out together, and soon the king and queen also awoke, and all the court, and gazed each other with great wonder, and the horses shook themselves, and the dogs jumped up and barked, the pigeons took their heads from under their wings and looked about and flew into the fields. The flies on the walls buzzed again. The fire in the kitchen blazed up. Round went the jack and round went the spit with the goose for the king's dinner upon it. The butler finished his draught of ale, the maid went on plucking the fowl, and the cook gave the boy the box on his ear, and then the prince and Briar Rose were married, and the wedding feast was given, and they lived happily together all their lives long. 
Snow White and Seven Little Dwarfs. Once upon a time there was a little princess called Snowdrop who had a cruel stepmother who was jealous of her. The queen had a magic mirror which could speak to her and when she looked into it and asked who was the fairest lady in the land, the mirror told her she was, for she was very beautiful, but as Snowdrop grew up, she became still more lovely than her stepmother, and the mirror did not fail to tell the queen this, so she ordered one of her huntsmen to take Snowdrop away and kill her, but he was too tender-hearted to do this, and left the maiden in the wood, and went home again. Snowdrop wandered about until she came to the house of seven little dwarfs, and they were so kind to take her in and let her live with them, she used to make their seven little beds and prepare the meals for the seven little men and they were all quite happy until the queen found out from her mirror that Snowdrop was still alive for, as it always told the truth, it still told her Snowdrop was the fairest lady in the land. She decided that Snowdrop must die, so she dyed her face, dressed up like an old peddler, and in this disguise she went to the home of the seven dwarfs, and called out, Laces for sale. Snowdrop peeped out of the window and said, Good day, mother, what have you to sell? Good laces, fine laces, laces of every colour, and she held out one that was made of gay silk. Snowdrop opened the door and bought the pretty lace. Child, said the old woman, you are a sight. Let me lace you properly for once. Snowdrop placed herself before the old woman who laced her so quickly and so tightly that she took away Snowdrop's breath and she fell down as though dead. Not long after the seven dwarfs came home, they found that she was laced so tight and cut the lace, whereupon Snowdrop began to breathe and soon came back to life again. When the queen got home and found by asking her mirror that Snowdrop was still alive, she planned to make an end of her for good. So she made a poison comb and disguised herself to look like a different old woman. She journeyed to the dwarf's home and induced Snowdrop to let her comb her hair. The minute she put the poison comb in her hair, Snowdrop fell down as though dead. When the seven dwarves came home, they found that poor Snowdrop on the floor, and suspecting the bad queen, began to look for the cause. Soon finding the comb, no sooner had they removed it, then Snowdrop came to life again. Upon the Queen's return, she found, by asking her mirror, that Snowdrop still lived. So she disguised herself a third time, and came to the dwarf's little house, and gave Snowdrop a poisoned apple. 
As soon as the little princess took a bite of it, it stuck in her throat and choked her. Oh, how grieved were the good little dwarfs. They made a fine glass coffin and put Snowdrop into it and were carrying her away to bury her when they met a prince who fell in love with a little dead maiden and begged the dwarfs to give her to him. The dwarfs were so sorry for him they consented and the prince's servants were to carry the coffin away when they stumbled and fell over the root of a tree. Snowdrop received such a violent jerk that the poisonous apple was jerked right out of her throat and she sat up alive and well again. Of course she married the prince and she, her husband and the good little dwarfs lived happily ever after. But the cruel stepmother came to a bad end and no one was even sorry for her. Little Red Riding Hood There was once such a sweet little maid who lived with her father and mother in a pretty little cottage at the edge of the village. At the further end of the wood was another pretty little cottage and in it lived her grandmother. Everybody loved this little girl her grandmother perhaps loved her most of all and gave her a great many pretty things. Once she gave her a red cloak with the hood which she always wore, so people called her Little Red Riding Hood. One morning, Little Red Riding Hood's mother said, Put on your things and go and see your grandmother. She has been ill. Take along this basket for her. I have put in it eggs, butter and cake and other dainties. It was a bright and sunny morning and Red Riding Hood was so happy that at first she wanted to dance through the wood. All around her grew pretty wild flowers which she loved so well, and she stopped to pick a bunch for her grandmother. Little Red Riding Hood wandered from her path, and was stooping to pick a flower, when from behind her a gruff voice said, Good morning, Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood turned around, and saw a great, big wolf. But Little Red Riding Hood did not know what a wicked beast the wolf was, so she was not afraid. What have you got in that basket, Little Red Riding Hood? Eggs and butter and cake, Mr. Wolf. Where are you going with them, Little Red Riding Hood? I am going to my grandmother, who is ill, Mr. Wolf. And where does your grandmother live, Little Red Riding Hood? Along that path, past the wide rose bushes, then through the gate at the end of the wood, Mr. Wolf. Then Mr. Wolf again said, Good morning, and set off, and Little Red Riding Hood again went in search of wild flowers. At last he reached the porch covered with flowers and knocked at the door of the cottage. Who is there? called the grandmother. Little Red Riding Hood, said the wicked wolf. Press the latch, open the door and walk in, said grandmother. The wolf pressed the latch and walked in when the grandmother lay in bed. 
He made one jump at her, but she jumped out of bed into a closet. Then the wolf put on the cap, which he had dropped, and crept under the bedclothes. In a short while, Little Red Riding Hood knocked at the door and walked in, saying, Good morning, Grandmother. I have brought you eggs, butter, and cake. And here is a bunch of flowers I gathered in the wood. As she came nearer the bed, she said, What big ears you have, Grandmother. All the better to hear you with, my dear. And what big eyes you have, Grandmother. All the better to see you with, my dear. But, Grandmother, what a big nose you have. All the better to smell with, my dear. But, Grandmother, what a big mouth you have. All the better to eat you up with, my dear. He said as he sprang at Little Red Riding Hood. Just at that moment, Little Red Riding Hood's father was passing the cottage and he heard her scream. He rushed in and with his axe chopped off Mr. Wolf's head. Everybody was happy that Little Red Riding Hood had escaped the wolf. Then Little Red Riding Hood's father carried her home and they lived happily ever after.